Last week we were together uh, talking about being unequally yoked. A lot of people didn't come back because of that sermon. You were offended. <laughs> no, no, really, it was, it was really cool um, because in 2 Corinthians 6, as we looked at the, the concept, uh, this command that Paul gives us to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, it's a hard concept, but there were so many, there were countless people that were like, hey, look, I brought someone for the first time and it was exactly what they needed to hear. Um, we had never heard it presented that way before. It was just what we needed in this time. Nobody was like, hey, thank you so much for just, you know, blowing sunshine and rainbows our way. They're like, no, thank you for the challenge. And I think that that's, that's we can all agree that that's why we're here. If it's challenging, but it's true, then it's good. It's discipline. And, and so that was the, the sermon last week. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That was in 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, in the world, but not of the world. Remember? In the world, but not of the world. How our fellowship matters, our community matters, who we're hanging out with matters, who we're entering into binding agreements with matters. I, got, I had someone talking about a, a lease agreement. That they're like, I was going to do it and I, was just, I felt convicted, but I didn't know why. And you were talking about agreements and contracts and I knew it was because the person I was going to enter into this agreement with wasn't a believer and it was going to negatively affect my walk. And, I, and I, I walked away from the agreement and found something else that was more godly. And it, like, just little stuff like that is so cool. Um, stuff that I never really intended, but the Lord did. And so, so not, not of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. Who are entering into partnerships. It matters. Challenging, but so good, so necessary. If you missed it, you can watch it online. Um, and, and like I said, uh, it, was, it was fun. And we're, we're back though. We're in, we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, unequally yoked, really highlighted what the church in Corinth was was dealing with their major problem for the church in Corinth, being surrounded by a culture that is consistently elevating sin and worldliness. Elevating sin, elevating debauchery, just really consumed in a culture of sin. We can, a lot of us can relate to that. Overrun by sinful desires. So for them, it was, it was absolutely necessary for this calling to be set apart, for sanctification. That was, that was Paul's main address to the church in Corinth. And he ends 2 Corinthians with a really tall order. I'm not going to teach on this. Uh, I did uh, earlier, but, but 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, in the final chapter, it's too good not to mention. He says this, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. That's how Paul signs off to the church of Corinth. Challenging. Examine yourself. And I, I mentioned this last week. That's the NLT version, by the way. I, I really like the way that that kind of paraphrased it for us to understand. And I mentioned it last week. If you're not examining yourself, if you're not actually taking inventory of your own life, inspecting your own life, then we're just wasting our time. There's more economical ways to get me to study the Bible than just that you guys are going to show up. That's not the point. The point is that you would examine yourself, that you would actually let God's word search out your heart and cut to your heart, that you would be changed. That's why we're here together learning. And Paul, he's saying, he's saying to the church of Corinth, I can't, I can't do this part for you. I can't do it for you. I can teach. I can teach you what to do, but I can't actually apply it to yourself. You got to look in the mirror, realize what you see, and want to worship God enough to change. James 1, 23 and 24 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, everyone here is a hearer of the word, that's for sure. We're all here listening. And not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For his, he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. You forget how ugly you are when you walk away from the mirror. But the mirror, especially those, those mirrors where you're, you're doing your makeup, ladies, and it's like three times magnified. You're like, oh my gosh. I look at that mirror sometimes in the bathroom. I'm like, that, that is not good. But that's, that's the mirror. That's God's word showing us. And to walk away from God's word without applying it to your life is like walking away from the mirror and forgetting what you look like. I taught the men's Bible study Wednesday night, and we, were going, we are going through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And I titled that sermon, Inspecting the Walls, because we were in the beginning of Nehemiah, in the first few chapters of Nehemiah, before Nehemiah actually starts building the wall, rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And the first thing he has to do before he can rebuild the walls, he needs an honest, complete 
difficult assessment of all the damages of the walls. The walls were broken down. The gates were burnt. And Paul, and, excuse me, Paul, Nehemiah needed to, to go around and check out all of the dilapidation of the walls meticulously, focusing on all the terrible parts of it. He's not going around the wall going like, oh, you know what? It's not really as bad as it looks like. It's not that bad. That you have to be honest with yourself when you're inspecting something that you're trying to rebuild. You got to be honest. Pastor Craig Linkwood's grandfather, Alan Redpath, he actually is the author of the book that we're going through in our men's Bible study. And he says this, it is utter folly to refuse to believe that things are as bad as they really are. It is vital in any undertaking for God to know the worst. For whenever there is to be a wonderful movement of the Holy Spirit, it begins with someone like Nehemiah who is bold enough to look at the facts, to diagnose them, and then to rise to the task. So when Nehemiah, he's going around the walls viewing the damages, um, the, he, there's, the gnats is so funny. I, can't, I have like OCD, so like when I see a gnat, I have to hit it. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, the, the word viewed for this word, as Nehemiah is going around viewing, he's viewed, he viewed this gate, he viewed that gate, it means probing a wound, a wound to see, an injury to see the extent of its damages. A lot of you guys know that feeling. When you get hurt, or you get a cut or something, and actually the examination of the wound hurts more than actually getting the wound. Or resetting the bone actually hurts more than breaking the bone. These things, the examination part, in order to clearly understand what's wrong, sometimes, oftentimes, it hurts even more than the wound itself. This is the call. Men, if you, if you want to learn more about Nehemiah, this is the, the shameless men's ministry plug, Wednesday nights here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. Our women's ministry meets on Wednesday nights also over in the multi-purpose room. We didn't relegate them to the multi-purpose room because we wanted to. They, they, desi- they desired that room, okay? They wanted the NPR. We're in here, and, and that's what we're doing on Wednesday nights. Come check it out if you are a man. Raise your hand if you're a man. It shouldn't be confusing. Thank you. Examine yourself, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. And this call for, for spiritual inspection of our own hearts is what Paul leaves the church in Corinth with. Examine yourself. He says in, in 1 Corinthians thirteen ten, I am writing this to you before I come. He's signing off on this, hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come. Basically he says, I hope this letter finds you before I do. <laughs> Tough pill to swallow. Difficult letter to receive from the Apostle Paul. There's only one epistle we have that comes with an even bigger pill to swallow, an even harsher tone. And that's our next book in the Anchored Reading, if you've been reading along with us. That's the book of Galatians. Galatians. If you guys need a a Bible, our ushers will bring them out. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. I got to get us there to all the way to Galatians chapter 4. Harsher, even harsher than I hope this letter finds you before I do. Second Corinthians and Galatians, they are the only two epistles, only two epistles, where Paul is writing to a place, so not people like, uh, like Philemon, Titus, where Paul's writing to actual places that he doesn't express his thankfulness to the people receiving the letter. And it, we can kind of assume that's because he has a, a proverbial bone to pick with them. Both 2 Corinthians and Galatians. You don't believe me. Let's look at it real fast. Romans 1.8, epistle to the church in Rome. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Beautiful. First, even 1 Corinthians, when Paul still had a little bit of patience with them. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. What about the church in Ephesus? Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you. In Philippi, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Teacher's pet, the Philippians. Every remembrance. There's nobody. I love, I, I love all of my family dearly. There's nobody that every remembrance of them, I thank God for them. That's huge. That's a huge undertaking. What about the Colossians? We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. 
Thessalonica, we give thanks to God always for you. Even again, in 2 Thessalonians, we are bound to thank God always for you. Even 2 Corinthians is not that bad. Even though Paul's not expressing thankfulness, he's, he's comforting them. He's talking about the God of comfort. They're going through issues, trials, tribulations, difficulties. And he says that the comfort that God comforts you with, you're, you have that comfort to comfort others with. The comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Comforting, comforting. What about Galatians? What about, what about the church in Galatia? And I can imagine them... You know, the leaders of the church, all the churches in the, the area, they gather. We got a letter from Paul. We got a letter from Paul. Finally, it was only a year ago that he was here, and we got a letter from him. Let's see what he says. I'm sure he's very thankful for us like all the others. I marvel. Oh, he's marveling that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ. I'm astonished by your unfaithfulness is what Paul says to them. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. He's got to have the wrong church. Are you sure we're not missing a page or something? It's got to be the wrong church. Let's, let's flip through. They flip through. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Oh, no, he de- he's definitely talking to us. <laughs> definitely. That's actually our name. Yeah, we put it there. Oh, foolish Galatians. And we open this harsher letter to the church in the region of Galatia, a harsher letter than, than, the, than to the church in Corinth, even, who had... Tons of issues. A harsher letter, but I think we'll find a, a sweeter application. Because the, the problem that the church in the region of Galatia had is the opposite problem that the church in Corinth had. Two different problems. Corinth, too much sin. Too much sin. You guys are just, it's debauchery. Galatia, too much religion. And I, and I say that tongue in cheek. There, you can never have too much of true religion. We understand this. Can't have too much true religion, but religiosity, kind of man-made religion. Too much, too much man-made religion. Corinth, too much sin. Galatia, they were bewitched by a false gospel. A false gospel. A different gospel. A gospel to abandon grace for legalism. Abandon justification by faith and, and, and grace by works now, abandoning it, abandoning it for justification by works. And it happened quickly, like I said, it was just a year after Paul was there. These false gospels, doesn't take long for them to take root. So I says, I marvel at how soon, how soon, I was just there, guys, come on. And, and you might think, I don't really, I don't remember, we went through Acts, I don't remember Paul really going to Galatia, wherever that is, I don't even, where is Galatia? Well, here's a map. I don't remember going to him going to Galatia in Acts 13 and 14 because it's not recorded as Galatia. Because Galatia is not a city. It's a region, a large region. All of the other epistles that Paul writes to places are cities. Galatia is a huge region with the cities that he visited in it. Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium. Lystra, Derby, all of these places are mentioned that Paul is going and planting churches in Acts, but they're all Galatia, all of them. And so he's pointing out, he's, he's pointing out this huge glaring issue to this huge region of churches, because we see, right, we see all the other little, the little cities, they're not little, but in comparison to the region of Galatia, Colossae, Ephesus, we see Rome up there, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, all the cities, but no, Galatia, the region, Region. He probably sat down. I imagine him sitting down. Maybe he starts to write, you know, the, the letter to the church in Lystra or Derby. And he's like, you know what? No, they all need to hear this. All of them need to hear this letter. Huge region. Huge, universal, colossal problem. Legalism. Formal legalism. I need to, to follow the law in order to be accepted into the family of God. And Paul, he, he addresses this main, this main concern in this first chapter. I marvel, the continuation of what I read in the introduction, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, Paul's saying, even if I, the apostles, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what you have what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. 
As we have said before, so now I say again, like as if they forgot already one sentence later. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, so that was preached to you and that you have received, let him be accursed. He equates turning away from the gospel that they received, he equates that to turning away from God himself. Turning away. Christianity is not one God with multiple different gospel options. You can pick kind of all these other different uh, gospels. No. One God, one gospel, the gospel of the grace of Christ. It might be touted as gospel 2.0. It might be uh, touted as the next smartest, coolest thing. But there is none. And in fact, whoever preaches that gospel, the wrong one, the incorrect one, is accursed. I don't care if it's your grandma. I don't care if it's an angel from heaven. You're accursed. See, the, why the problem in Galatia was so critical, even more critical, I argue, than the problem in Corinth, is because there, there is no salvation with a false gospel. The, the Corinthians had a sanctification issue. The Galatians have a salvation issue. Salvation. What must I do to be, be saved? Legalism says work as hard as you possibly can to be saved. Judaism says obey the law. Jesus says grace through faith. And so what's pulling them, pulling, pulling the Galatians from grace through faith to faith by works and to be saved by works? It's an identity crisis. They've been bewitched. They're being lied to. They're being tricked into believing a false understanding of how one becomes the member of the family of God. It's no longer through blood. No longer through blood. It's no longer through the law, obedience of the law. No. This long section, I'm going to read it to you. Try, try to pay attention a little bit. Galatians 3, 1 through 9. Again, remember, we're getting to Galatians 4 where we're going to be. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Riddle me this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Very, very bold claim to the Jews. And, and the, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed, not just Israel. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Micah, it's, it's getting late in the afternoon. I already, I'm kind of tired. I don't know what you just said. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. Whoa, what does that even mean? <laughs> I am one of them, and so are you. You're like, my dad's name is not Abraham. What is it? Well, I don't get it. I don't get it. How are you? What makes you a son of Abraham? Raise your hand if it's blood. There's only some of us in the room where that it is blood. It's not for most of us. Is it works? No. Is it your nationality? No, no longer. You're no longer saved by your nationality or by your blood, it's grace. The grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul, throughout his, this entire epistle to the church in Galatia, he's flipping this false gospel of legalism on its head, saying that if it's membership into the family of God that you desire, and to Abraham's family, then, then you can receive that membership the same way that Abraham received it, through faith, by faith not works. If it's sonship to the father that you want, you're not going to be able to earn it. Just like nobody in the Old Testament was able to earn it. If it's an inheritance that you're after, there's only one way to get it now. You don't work yourself into the family of God. 
You are adopted into the family of God. And if you are adopted into God's family, you are an heir of God and no longer a slave, but a son. An heir of God. This is our our message. I told you I'd get you to Galatians 4. We're at Galatians 4. We're going to start at verse 1. Remember last week we, we ended with this idea that you have a new identity, a new inheritance, and with those things come a new responsibility in God's house. A new responsibility to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, sanctification. Last week we talked about the the responsibilities of living in God's house, but today I want to talk about the inheritance of of being in the family of God, the inheritance of the adopted. What do you get for being in the family of God, and why would you want it any other way? So we're going to stand for the reading of our main passage today, Galatians chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 1. Thank you for bearing with me as we covered all of our bases. I got you all the way from the middle of 2 Corinthians to the end of Galatians. There you go. Good job. Galatians 4, 1 through 7. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for giving us your word for showing us what it means to have true sonship, what it means to be adopted into into your family, Lord. We we give you the study. We pray that it wouldn't be my words that are heard, but yours alone. Lord, would my words be forgotten? God, we love you and give it all to you in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Take a seat. An heir of God. Last week, we ended with the story of adoption of my youngest daughter, Maeve, and how we finalized the adoption and, and how I, I had to swear that I would leave, that, that she had equal rights to my inheritance, which after careful uh, deliberation, I realized that there is none. That's what I said. Uh, that, that was my joke. But just pretend like there was one. Pretend like there was an inheritance. Pretend. These first few verses of, of Galatians 4. If I, had, if I had an inheritance to give monetarily, Although my children, they're technically heirs, does my inheritance benefit them any now? This is what Paul is saying in these first two verses. Do they get it yet? No. It is unavailable to them until either an appointed time, if it's like a trust, or until I die. An, appo- an appointed time. This was the idea of Roman uh, uh, inheritances here. An appointed time, like a trust. You get to appoint a time for this trust to be released. They can't just take their inheritance and go do whatever they want with it. They have yet to meet the requirements to receive their inheritance. They have no freedom. They're in a way no, uh, no better off in my house than a slave. No better off. They still have to do what I ask because they live in my house. If anything, it's almost kind of worse. They have, to, they have to do everything I have, and they don't, and it's hard. It's hard. Whether they follow the rules or not, the point of the rules, the point of the, the law that I'm laying down in my house for my heirs is that they would be trained, that one day they might be worthy of an inheritance. So Paul, he's using this as an illustration for our spiritual state before Jesus, the Jews' spiritual state before the Messiah Without grace through faith in Jesus, the laws of God's house were there as a schoolmaster to point us to him, to to train us, to to allow us to long for him. Pastor Rob taught on Galatians 3 in the other services, if you missed that. In the Old Testament, God's people, they were still considered sons and daughters, but, but their relationship was incomplete. The law couldn't fulfill, fully provide the inheritance that they desire. It was a guide. Paul, he's in, in these first two verses, he's trying to highlight the stupidity of them, 
of, of this idea that you would want to, you would desire to return to such bondage. That you would desire to turn back to what is basically slavery. Through Christ you've received the inheritance, but now by, by turning back to the law, you put yourself back into bondage. Why would you want to do that, O oh foolish Galatians? Why would we ever want to do that? Verse 3, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. The ESV says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Elementary principles, I love this. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's cool. The definition of it, this phrase in the Greek, the letters of the alphabet as the elements of of speech, not, however, the written characters, but the spoken sounds. Kind of like the baby. Kind of like the baby. Not speech yet, just spoken sounds. Basically, in bondage before Christ, Jews, they're in bondage to the ABCs, the foundational aspects of the world, of religion, incomplete religion without its fullness yet recognized. Just the, the, the basics of it. And for the Gentiles, the basic concepts of even pagan religions. The, the, the form of reconnecting with God, but without the fullness to articulate it yet. Not the, without the fullness of articulate speech. I have this picture of humanity without Jesus, without Christ, before the Messiah, trying, striving to reconnect with the Creator. And, and all they can do is they can just make sounds without words. Just groans. That they know what they, 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 they feel this desire, but they don't know. They, they can't quite articulate it yet. No articulation. My son, Solomon, is just starting to make these noises. I call them goo-goos, the little goo-goos. And, and you can see it in him. He wants to say something to me. I have no idea what it really is yet, but he wants to talk. He wants to communicate with the Father, but he doesn't have the means to do it yet. This is humanity before Jesus. This is you before Christ. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you into going back to that? Going back to the, the elementary ways of the world, grasping in the dark, where he's illuminated. You, you, you try to darken, giving up such a great deep understanding of the fullness of Christ in exchange for the broken elementary principles. If you, if you stand on the street and you ask people, this is the basic elementary principles of religion, of trying to... Re Relangare, I think, is to reconnect to God. These are the base. This, if you ask people on the street whether or not they're going to heaven, majority of people will say, "What? Well, yes, for sure, I'm going to heaven." And then, if you ask them why, why are you going to go to heaven? What will they say? Because I'm a good person. Because I think I'm a good person. I think I'm a pretty good person. I, I think I've lived my life in a pretty a decent way, right? And then you take them through the Ten Commandments, and then systematically they admit, as Pastor Rob did earlier, they systematically admit that they have broken every single one of them. How many times a day does a good man sin? Just enough to disqualify you from the family of God. They've broken them. They've broken them. God's rules. The enemy wants you to resort back to the way that you were before, striving, striving to do good things to reconnect with God, instead of because you're already adopted. These are those elementary principles of the world. Trying to reconnect with God, but wholly incapable until what? Paul gives us the contrast of that broken incompleteness with our current reality in post Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in the era, era of grace. The gospel that Paul preached that they had received. He says in verse 4, but when the fullness of the time had come, the fullness of the time. Just as the 17-year-old the who knows that they're going to get their trust fund on their 18th birthday eagerly, eagerly is waiting for it. Humanity eagerly waiting to claim true sonship. Eagerly. I can't wait. And how is God going to accomplish this task of letting us into his perfect family? How can he do it? You're eagerly waiting, but how is it even possible? How can he do it? God sent forth his son. His son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. There's an inheritance awaiting God's image bearers. 
We're all God's image bearers, all of humanity. There's an inheritance waiting, but no one, no one could truly attain it until Jesus. No one could get the inheritance until Jesus. The one true begotten son of God. The only one who it not only rightfully belonged to, but fulfilled the sonship requirements to lay hold of the inheritance in its fullness. So not only was he the only one that it belonged to, but he's the only one that actually could attain it. He's the only one that met the requirements. What were those requirements? Sinlessness. Perfection. That's what it required. I was watching an evangelism encounter, if you want to call that, call it that. Um, and this, this woman walks up to a microphone. The, the person of faith um, is standing on a stage, and the woman walks up. This is a very, like, broken down. I think it's on a school campus. And she, she, thinks, she thinks she has something cool to say. She says, what are the parameters to get into heaven? The evangelist answers, perfection. I love that answer. Because we would try, to, we would try to, to, to explain it away immediately. Like, oh, how do I make this easier? No, no, the parameters, it's perfection. You got to be perfect. And she, look, she looks so puzzled. She's like, perfection? She literally like kind of chuckles and, and with a big question mark. So is there anyone in heaven right now? She thinks she got him. He goes confidently, yeah, yes, there is. She's like, wait, wait, wait. So they were perfect then, right? He goes, nope, they weren't perfect. She's like, okay, okay, obviously this guy's insane. Let me get this straight. The parameters to get into heaven are perfection. There are people in heaven, but nobody has been perfect. And he goes, correct. She goes, how is that possible? And then he like cracks the biggest smile. It's like, it's like gospel t-ball. She, 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 she set herself up. He answers with one word. He goes, grace. And he begins to explain the gospel. It's beautiful. Son of God, fully God, but born of a woman, born under the law, perfectly fulfilling the law to redeem those who were under the law like only he could not just fulfilling the law so that he could prove his own sonship to everybody watching, but to redeem us. This is the grace of Christ. Christ uses his inheritance, the one that he, only he deserves, he uses it to purchase us out of the slave market from our bondage to sin and to the elementary things of this world. Redemption. Redemption is part of our inheritance Arguably the biggest part of our inheritance. But here's the beautiful thing about what Paul's trying to tell the church in Galatia is that it doesn't end there. Redemption, it doesn't end there. It starts there. He redeems us not to be his own slaves. He doesn't buy us out of the slave market so that we can just be slaves again. Why? That we might receive the adoption as sons. It would have been enough to be purchased out of the world's slave market into God's, but we're not just purchased out, but elevated to the status of sons and daughters of the Most High. And notice here that adoption is not earned. It's what? Received. Received. There's nothing, Galatians, oh foolish Galatians, there's nothing you can do to earn this. It's not something that you lost, that you dropped. You attained it through the law and now you're going back to the law. You never had it. You never had it, not in its fullness. The adoption is received. We gain sonship through Jesus. No Jew in the Old Testament ever had this in its completion. Redemption through Christ is not simply a restoration of what we lost through the fall. It's not only that we gain in Christ something that Adam never had. True redemption through sonship with co-heirs with God's only begotten son, an heir and in these last two verses, Paul, he, he, he's continuing to highlight the true unfathomable beauty of what it means to receive that adoption as sons. We might receive the adoption as sons, verse six, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. It just keeps getting better and better. He's, Paul is desperately trying to get the Galatians to understand, just like I'm desperately trying to get you guys to understand what it means to be adopted into the family of God. Deeper, infinitely more fulfilling than, than we've ever understood it under the, the elementary ways of Judaism and paganism. This isn't just another religion that just happens to be right. 
No, 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 I, I didn't deserve redemption to be purchased at a price. I, I definitely didn't deserve adoption into a new family. And now, not only am I legally adopted on paper, legally adopted on paper, which is one thing that I don't deserve, God sent forth the spirit of his only begotten son into my heart. I don't think you guys get it. We don't just get legal sonship, we get experiential sonship. That's why the, when, I, when I had the, the adoption uh, ceremony, legally adopting my daughter, it was cool, it was sweet, but she was already my daughter. Legally is one thing, but does that change how I treat her? Absolutely not. She's my daughter. She was my daughter. Experiential sonship. John Stott says this in such a beautiful way. Thus, God's purpose was not only to secure our sonship by his son, but to assure us of it by his spirit. He sent his son that we might have the status of sonship, and he sent his spirit that we might have an experience of it. If I could send forth, which I can, if I could send forth the spirit of one of my children into you, anybody in this room, the way that we looked at each other would immediately change. Our experience would be completely different. I love you guys. But if I could send forth the spirit of my son into your heart, we would immediately be knitted together on a level unlike anything else. Everything would instantly change about our relationship. I'm convinced that this is what God does supernaturally in a broken way in the human heart when you adopt. The legal ceremony was cool. But she's not just legally my child. Experientially, she is my child. And there are some absolutely terrible dads, terrible humans out there, terrible families out there. Because we live in a, in a sinful, fallen world. One of the pastors on staff was telling me about a, uh, a story of a, a family that he knew who went over to Africa. They fell in love with this, this beautiful girl, old enough to understand everything that was happening, and fell in love with them and brought her, brought her back to the States and, and lived with her and, and hung out with her. And she experienced, she experienced some kind, some form of, of family. Um, but I'm sure just kind of behaviorally, I think it was over a year, behaviorally, it just wasn't really what they envisioned for their families. Just really wasn't quite what they, uh, what they thought it would be to adopt, to have a child. Um, it was a little it was kind of, I'm not really, it's a little inconvenient to take on a project child right now, actually, now that I think about it. And they, having not legally finalized the adoption, they, they just sent her back. I think, yeah, we're done. We're done. Project child. You know, that's, that's you and I. <laughs> Project children. That unlike that child, cosmically, we deserve to be abandoned. We deserve to be sent back. But our father doesn't, doesn't just say that he wants to adopt us. He doesn't just show up in a third world country of our sin and despair and go, you know what, that looks cool. Let's try that out for a moment. No. He sends forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. This is the message that God put on my heart after last week. Look, not being unequally yoked with unbelievers is part of sanctification. But you need to know that regardless of how you mess things up, which you will, he never stops looking at you like a son. He never stops looking at you like a daughter. He doesn't rescue you to abandon you. No. No, he gives you true sonship. Once we've received that spirit, there's nothing that we can do to get God to stop looking at us like his kids. I don't get to just be a child of God, I get treated like one. And likewise, I don't get to just have a heavenly father, I get to treat him like one. Do you understand that this is crazy? God has sent forth the spirit of his son into my heart so that he now looks at me like not just somebody Somebody that happened to be legally adopted, but actual sonship. He looks at me like, like I am his actual son. I am his actual son. And then, 
And then what? That spirit crying out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father is this, this intimate closeness that we get, to, we get to cry out to our heavenly Father in that same way. We get to treat him like our dad. I didn't have any, my dad's here. I didn't, I didn't have any cool, cute names that, that we called our parents. It was just mom and dad. Like, that's all we kind of got. It's just dad. Dad. But even that changes everything, right? Dad. <laughs> Crying out, dad. Dad, I need help. Dad, I need help. Dad, I'm scared. I hear that one a lot in my house. <laughs> Dad, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get this, Dad. Dad, Dad, check this out. <laughs> dad, I messed up. I messed up, Dad. Hey, Dad, can you talk? Can you talk for a minute? <laughs> I love you, Dad. When I, when I started writing this, ser- this sermon, I, it was my intention that I was going to focus on all the cool stuff that we get as heirs of God. Just all the cool stuff. But then I was, I was just stopped dead in my tracks at this verse that he looks at us like sons and we, he treats us like sons and we get to treat him like dad. Just the fact that he looks at me like I'm his own is, tr- is truly enough. That he allows me to look at him as my own. That he hears me when I call out Abba Father, Dad. Martin Luther says this, let the law, sin, and the devil cry out against us until their outcry fills heaven and earth, the spirit of God outcries them all. Our feeble groans, Abba Father, will be heard of God sooner than the combined racket of hell, sin, and the law. He listens. He hears you when you call. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's such a deeper, more serious issue than, than being unequally yoked. That sanctification, this is salvation. Who has bewitched you into thinking that the law could be a greater experience than this grace that he's shown us? This is our inheritance. Not just the things, but God himself. Psalm 16, 5 and 6. Oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me. In pleasant places, yes, I have a good inheritance. You are my portion. I'm reminded of one of my favorite songs by Cody Carnes. I've never done it before because sometimes that kind of ruins it for me. Like, it's just a song that I worship to. It's called Nothing Else. And my favorite line, and it sounds a little weird at first because you're like, wait, I don't really get it. That's the point. My favorite line is, I'm not, I'm not here for blessings. What? I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. So much more than you can ever do, I just want you. That's it. You know what a child, before the cares of the world influence him, desire more than any monetary inheritance? It's just time. It's just presence. Remember that. Our, our God holds the heavens in the span of his hands He holds time in the span of his hands. He spoke it into existence. He's perfect. He's not too busy. He's not too busy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. No longer a slave but a son. We've been redeemed from the slave block, but not just redeemed We've been legally adopted into into the family of God, but, but not just legally adopted but experientially adopted. He actually looks at us as his sons and daughters. He sends forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And that would be enough. But we become also co-heirs to all, to all God has with Jesus Christ himself. Ephesians 2, 6. And raised us up together. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sit together. Heirs, heirs, co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ to the throne. Elevated to sonship from slavery. The enemy will try to sow lies and bewitch you, as the enemy was doing in Galatia, into thinking that you've lost your sonship. You may be a prodigal, but you will never, never miss out on this. You may be a prodigal, but you will always be a son. 
The prodigal, the prodigal son takes his inheritance. I'm going to invite the worship team up as we close. The prodigal son, what does he do? He takes his inheritance that doesn't even belong to him. Doesn't belong. To, he doesn't rightfully really deserve it yet, but in grace he's given it. He takes the inheritance and he squanders it. And the son said to him, comes back, running back to the father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Anybody ever felt that way? I felt that way. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. He slaps a Rolex on his wrist. Put, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. You may be a prodigal, but you'll always, always be a son. The father's arms are always open wide for his kids. Amen? Fatted calf, a ring, and a robe. It's not because you deserve it. You deserve the opposite, but he gives it because he doesn't just see you as legally adopted. He actually sees in you his son as he sent forth the spirit of his only begotten son into your hearts. That's why why we receive it. That's why we receive this adoption. It's so much more than the elementary principles of this world that, that man's religion says, just do good enough, just do enough and you'll be accepted in. You won't. You'll never be accepted in unless he looks at you and sees a son and a daughter. Amen? Amen. And just like the, the father's arms are open wide for our, our earthly experience for his sons and daughters, it's the same way when we come to die that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Rest now in heaven. We long for that day. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for redeeming us, for saving us. Lord, we receive the adoption and we thank you. Actual sonship. Lord, we were never able to do it without you. And now we can, once slaves, now sons and daughters, God, we we glorify you with our, our bodies now and our minds and everything we have. Lord, as we, we see our position in your house, Lord, a position that's undeserved, we want to give you everything that you deserve, which is all of our lives, all of our worship, all of our relationships. God, we submit to you. We thank you for redeeming us. Lord, we thank you for making us heirs. How do we, we take our inheritance and we smile. Lord, but we, over all of it, we just want to be in your presence. It's enough. God, and you shower grace on top of that. We love you in your mighty name. Amen.